reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. 
Good evening, my name is Tim Wiseman and I serve as pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Holy Trinity in the city of New York. And please know whether you've been to Bach Vespers at Holy Trinity a thousand times or this evening marks your first time experiencing this music in this place. I'm glad that you are here. So I'm going to do this thing where I condense a whole lot of really interesting late medieval history into 100 words or less. Wish me luck because here we go. On October 31st, 1517, an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther, who was just 10 days shy of his 34th birthday, most likely, probably, maybe, nails 95 theses to the doors of the castle church in Wittenberg. Which is all to say that the city of Wittenberg in 1517 is the capital of what's called the Electorate of Saxony, a state of the Holy Roman Empire. And for most of Luther's life, the Elector of Saxony is a prince known as Frederick the wise, one of Luther's foremost protectors. Whether or not he believes he'd ever become elector himself, spoiler alert, he would, Frederick's nephew, Prince Johann Friedrich, begins corresponding with Luther a couple of years after the 95 theses are most likely maybe nailed to the church doors in Wittenberg. Notably, when Prince Johann Friedrich is only 17 years old. In one well-studied letter, 17-year-old Prince Johann Friedrich famously asks Martin Luther for some advice. Undoubtedly moved by his uncle's protection of Luther, whom he admires, Prince Johann Friedrich asks Luther, to point to a biblical model for good and pious leadership that he might study and imitate when someday he succeeds his uncle and his father as the elector of Saxony. Two years later, Luther writes him back. Serene and high-born prince, gracious lord, your grace's kind letters have lately come into my hands, and their cheering contents brought me much joy. And that's nice to hear, Martin, but I just want to find out who you're going to tell him about. Perhaps one of the great kings of the Hebrew scriptures, David or Solomon. Perhaps Luther will commend to him the witness of the apostle Paul, quoting Romans or to leave the most obvious choice for last, I wonder if Luther will point young Johann Friedrich to Jesus, specifically to his Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. By way of reply, Luther writes, I send you this little exposition of the Magnificat. Yes, in a reply to his grace, the serene high-born prince and future elector of Saxony, who had asked Luther for a biblical model for good and pious leadership, Luther points to Mary and her song. And not the famously whitewashed version of Mary, capital M, Mother of Jesus, with the blue head covering, the gorgeous complexion, and the perfect smile. But Mary, the daughter of Anna from Galilee, who knows exactly what it's going to be like to carry a child out of wedlock in Nazareth, who will spend the next nine months of her life wondering how long her fiancé will stick around, and who yet has the audacity to sing this song and call herself blessed by God. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. After all, Mary gets it. The same God who comes to her through an angel 
to tell her that she will bear a son and that he will be the Messiah. He is the God of Noah, who once set a bow in the clouds as a sign of the covenant. He is the God of Sarah and Abraham, unlikely parents whose descendants number like the stars in the heavens. He is the God of Rachel and Jacob, whose son Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, yet saved God's people from certain death is the God of Moses who stared down a Pharaoh and led an exodus across the Red Sea. Mary knows the God of whom she sings. This is the same God her ancestors have known from generation to generation, who even today casts down the mighty, exalts the lowly, shatters pride, builds trust, offers mercy, and grants life, forgiveness, and salvation. Not because of anything we've done or earned, but because God is. Martin Luther quite liked the Magnificat. One of the ways you can tell is the, quote, little exposition he wrote for Johann Friedrich. Contains over 28,000 words. That said, the Magnificat is also one of the first biblical texts Luther chose to translate from Latin into German. And he wrote a hymn tune for it. Well, that's not exactly right. Luther pairs his translation of Mary's song with his take on an ancient Gregorian chant known as the Tonus Peregrinus. But there's more. Because the Tonus Peregrinus very well might have gotten that name, given its long association with Psalm 114, which describes the exodus from Egypt, Peregrinus foreign, by pairing his translation of Mary's song with his take on the Tonus Peregrinus, Martin Luther isn't just making music, he's doing theology, forging a relationship between Mary's song and the exodus she knows all about. After all, she says, God has shown strength with God's arm. And that connection between Mary's song and the Exodus, encouraged by Luther's use of the Tonus Peregrinus, was also known to Johann Sebastian Bach. As you hear his cantata number 10 in a few minutes, when you hear the soprano line in the first movement, when you hear the trumpet and oboes carry the same tune above the duet in the fifth movement, and when you hear the sopranos pick up this melody again in the final chorus, that's the tune. That's the tonus peregrinus. That's the cantus firmus. That's the exodus showing up in the Magnificat. And whether we're talking about Noah, who looked to the skies for a sign, Abraham and Sarah, who laughed when God told them they were pregnant. Moses, who led God's people right on up to the Red Sea. Or Mary, who responds to miracles by singing songs. They know ours is a God who shows up. And the Exodus is the gold standard. But there's more. Because what God knows, that Moses knows, that Mary knows, that Martin Luther knows, that Johann Sebastian Bach knows, that you and me are about to discover, is that the liberation God accomplishes in the Exodus, the justice God brings to God's people, is a theme that ought to ground us. Notice the pun. Though instead of parting a sea to create dry land, God's next dream is that every valley shall be filled, every mountain be made low, the crooked be made straight, and the rough ways be made smooth. 
And in this next exodus from injustice and tyranny, a little child shall lead them. And the gift of the incarnation celebrated by Mary's song is that not only will the Christ child lead God's people in that age, but Jesus is still leading us, leading us out of the exile we have recently found ourselves in, leading us out of the bondage of deceit, denialism, lies, and fake news, leading us to life forgiveness and salvation because God keeps showing up. And with Noah, Sarah, Moses, and Mary before us, we know that God tends to show up through other people. Maybe that's why Luther commended Mary's song to Johann Friedrich. After all, I'd argue that a fine indication of good and pious leadership is whether you're actually allowing God to work through you. And if you're casting down the mighty, exalting the lowly, shattering pride, building trust, and offering mercy, at least in your own corner of the universe, I'd say God's working through you just fine. Because a shoot is coming out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch is growing of its roots. With righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. The prophet foretold it, Mary trusted it, and I am convinced that an exodus of God's people into a place of liberation and joy can happen again. Savior of the nations, come. Work through us and redeem us that with Mary and all the angels in the heavens, we make truth, justice, hope, and change. Our chant, our melody, our tonus, our delight, and our song. And all God's people said, Amen.
Thank you. 